So already there's a, there's a few questions that we will cover this um, in the in the presentation, but um, there are some questions about whether or not this is going to be recorded and maybe released at some point. Um, um, to my knowledge, I, I know it's being recorded, but I don't know how soon it's going to be available to parents. Um, so at the very least, we're going to be sending out um, the slides to people for reference for the future. So do your best just to listen and and um, and um, yeah, a lot of your questions will probably be answered during the presentation, but if you need references, we can always send it to you uh, afterwards. And you'll have your, you'll have our information as well. Um, curious, okay, so we have about 15, we kind of plateaued a little bit. Um, I'm curious if anybody, anybody, any thoughts about how long we should wait for, for other parents to, to get going? I think we're good to go, Garrett. Cool. Yeah. Well, we can get started. Um, really want to thank you all for being here and thanks for being on time. Um, again, this is the, um, the webinar um, about navigating celiac disease with gluten-free living. Um, we're kind of expanding it tonight to include our um, IBD patients. That's Crohn's and colitis, ulcerative colitis patients. Um, and talking about the transition to college. And we have a, a great presentation for you tonight. Um, it's a, an exciting time in our patients' lives. And so we just wanna help uh, you all prepare for that and answer some questions about the process. So let's talk about what's gonna happen tonight. Uh, first, we're gonna hear um, just uh, a little bit of an introduction from each of our speakers. We're going to talk about the process of applying for accommodations uh, in college. We're going to talk about accommodations that are available to students with uh, inflammatory bowel disease and celiac disease. And just to put it out there, accommodations are just ways that your school can support you. And um, we'll get into the details of that. We're going to cover some specific dietary accommodations, um, tips and precautions specific to diet. We're gonna briefly touch on mental health and managing illness while in college. Um, we're gonna have a, a question and answer section at the end of our presentation. But um, as your questions come up, as much as we want you to be paying attention to what's being presented, uh, feel free to use the chat boxes um, and we will be uh, attending to those and answering questions as we can on the fly or we'll save some of them to the end of the presentation. Um, as far as the slides being available, if you regularly are getting emails from me, you are on one of our distribution lists. And so we'll be sending out the slides um, pretty quickly to you. If you don't get emails from me, if it's the first time you're meeting me or hearing from me, um, then uh, I will be including my email at the end of the presentation. Um, so you can uh, request them by email and I'll send the slides to you first of all. So without further ado, we can move on to the next slide. So your presenters, I'm, I'm kind of moderating this. I'm not gonna have the hugest part of speaking, but my name is Garrett Forshee. I'm a social worker with the Stanford Celiac Disease and IBD clinics. Um, I've been here since August of 2020. Um, I support our patients and families through um, conversations um, about any kind of needs um, with uh, resources in the community, needs at school, uh, mental health needs, um, I co-lead support groups with one of our other presenters here, and um, I also just discuss available resources in the community and the school environments with our patients. And Riley, if you can introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Riley Murray. Um, I work at the Office of Accessible Education at Stanford University, where I determine reasonable academic and housing accommodations. So I'm going to be speaking about what are accommodations, how to go about it, and what they can do and benefit you while you transfer and like start your higher education process. Hi, everyone. My name is Farah Maradini. I am a registered dietitian. I provide nutrition-related education, counseling, and support for our patients with celiac disease and IBD at Stanford Children's. And Anava? Yes, I will. 
I will also introduce myself. Thanks, Farah. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Anna Varen. Um, for those who I don't know on the call, I'm the psychologist here in our celiac center and our IBD center. Um, let's see, I've been here since 2017, but with our celiac center or program since 2020 and do some similar work to Garrett and do a lot of work supporting our patients and our families here in both of our programs and our center. Um, you know, everything from that first time when you were diagnosed with IBD to celiac um, to sort of any point in your care to young adulthood before you go to the adult side. So around coping and stress management and managing and emotions to managing physical symptoms and sort of everything in between um, and also co-lead support groups with Garrett. So really excited to be here. This is such a, such an exciting topic of going to school, but can be also quite stressful. Some of the best things in life can be stressful. So this is why we want to have this time to talk and to share resources and then to answer your questions tonight. Thank you, Anima. And without further ado, we're going to have our first presenter, uh, Riley Murray, take it away. Hi, all. So like I said, I'm Riley. Um, one fun thing, thing about me and probably the main reason why I do this presentation. I not only work at Stanford, but I also have Crohn's disease. And I've also had an ostomy. Marigold is my best friend uh, since 2017. Before that, we had Sandy. She was temporary. But now we are full-time bag baddie. Um, and I absolutely love her and adore her. And part of that, I really love doing these presentations and getting to connect with people that are just like me and who I hope that I can be the person that educates you so you don't go into higher education and experience some of the negative side effects or negative impacts of having IBD or maybe celiac um, in your higher education experience. So you're probably going to hear me say um, what is disability services? Quite a lot. Um, so I guess I should say, hey, Garrett, can you go to the next slide? Um, <laughs> so what is disability services? This is like the kind of the title that you're going to be looking for whenever you decide where you're going to go. So I've given some examples on the side with all these pictures. My office, the off of, Office of Accessible Education, sounds a lot different then if we go to the University of Florida, Disability Resource Center, Disability Center, et cetera. However, they all provide the same type of accommodations. They do the exact same thing. Um, so while in these services, these services provide equal access to ameliorating, so removing those access barriers as a result of your disability. And you don't have to identify with the word disability. Just please know that part of IBD, celiac, it does make you fall within this category. However, you don't have to identify it. Just know that is how you're going to receive services. Um, something really important, I'm gonna mention a lot of accommodations today. They are very specific to Stanford. However, they are very record, um, very similar to what you might find at other institutions. You are more than welcome to take pictures of my slides specifically if it helps you, but just know you'll also get the slides later on. Um, and then something important as well, whenever you go to a disability resource center that provides these services, they're all gonna have the same legal frameworks and abiding by the same legal rights and acts and amendments put into place when determining what is a reasonable accommodation. So what is this process look like? Can I go to the next slide? Thank you. So I kind of broke down this process into four categories. Step one, you kind of have to have a diagnosis. Guess what? You do, I assume, at least you're here. So I assume that you have a diagnosis. And from here, you are gonna start working with your medical care provider. Um, thankfully, you have a wonderful social worker, Garrett, who has wonderful documentation that I get all the time, that I adore, and it meets everything that I need. Um, I hope that gave you an ego boost, um, Garrett, because you definitely deserve it. 
So part of that documentation, and we'll kind of go over what it should look like, especially if you're seeking documentation from maybe a psychiatrist, maybe a therapist, a nutritionist, or maybe your doctor. And that could be a GI, that could be PCP, literally anything. But part of that, you need the diagnosis, you need the documentation. Now you need to go register with your Office of Accessible Education, your Disability Resource Center. And part of it that is taking your documentation to these people so they can read over what is your diagnosis and how it impacts you. So for example, you probably need to use the bathroom a lot, whether you have IBD or if you get accidentally glutened, you might be using the bathroom more due to abdominal bloating, um, diarrhea, vomiting, anything like this. These are kind of the symptoms that go along with IBD or a celiac, and they are going to be very individualized to you. So that documentation is really gonna be important for me or a person like me to understand what you're experiencing. And then within step three as well um, of like registering, you're gonna talk about all of this and then depending on what you say, you're gonna get some accommodations and that can either be in the academic setting, um, which we'll go over a little later, as well as in housing setting. And then from there, you get to implement it. Some universities have it to where you as the student have to go out and share a letter. It doesn't say your diagnosis on it. So it doesn't say Riley Murray has Crohn's disease. It's just gonna say you're registered and you have, and you qualify for accommodations. Um, so that stays anonymous and that stays with you. So what does documentation look like? Thankfully you have Garrett, like I said, however, if you decide to say, um, I also have OCD and social anxiety, which is really entertaining because I do presentations like this where I then ruminate over everything I say afterwards. However, if my psychiatrist were to write documentation, she might not know what that should look like. So usually this is kind of like what I ask for in documentation, especially um, understanding that this is kind of like an ongoing relationship. Um, sometimes students submit documentation and it's just a one-off and that's not really valid. So that's why I kind of need to understand if this is an ongoing or if you kind of went to an online website and got the documentation. None of you are gonna do that. It's just why we request. On top of that, it's gonna outline your disability, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, indeterminate colitis, celiac, mental health diagnoses are also valid. And then the main part, I wanna know how you're impacted, like I said again. And then as well, um, sometimes additional context is needed when it comes to medication. So let's say you get rheumatoid infusions every six to eight weeks. That means that you're probably gonna need to miss some class from time to time. So that can help substantiate the reason for um, needing assignment extensions or missing class more frequently. That can also lead to understanding why a person might need to come into your dorm to give you an infusion, but it kind of is all individualized to you. Um, and then your provider can always recommend accommodations it's not like a must, however, go for it. Sometimes they might come up with something that I've never heard of and it could be very beneficial. And then I always like to put who can provide documentation on the side, social worker, your GI doctor, nutritionist, therapist, psychiatrist, physical therapist. Um, literally, it just has to be a person that can speak to that condition. So you wouldn't have a radiologist talking about, I don't know, your nutritional needs. That's a little silly. I need how it links together. All right, next one, Garrett. Now, um, this has become my little passion project as well is understanding the importance of mental health. Um, 
I believe Anava will speak about this like later on, but this is also a really good segue of saying, if you do struggle, if you have mental health conditions and you don't know if it's a chicken and the egg situation, I am equally there. I don't know if my mental health struggles are as a result of my Crohn's disease and the surgeries I've gone through, but I definitely know it's impacted by it and it's kind of increased as a result of that. And I also know that my GI and my Crohn's really gets aggravated if I am having a stressful time at work. I was actually joking before this that my ostomy has been farting up a storm. So I am in good hands tonight with the community I'm with, but it definitely can be a little much to go through on a given day, especially if I have a lot of presentations. Um, so please feel free to reach out and uh, submit additional documentation, work with anybody, um, as well as most universities have free resources like psychiat or not psychiatrists, but therapists on site. So please feel free to connect with them as well as finding organizations, clubs, disability community spaces that um, are going to pe be people just like you. And then you can also do that within your other identity communities as well. So if you're a person of color, finding that on campus, if you have any religious orientation, also finding that. All right. So now we get into the nitty gritty of accommodations, which is so fun. So we're gonna kind of focus on three different types. At least that is how I've divided it up. So if you are a parent, um, honestly, this would be a really good page to like screenshot or to like kind of consider um, when talking with, or at least not parent, but you can screenshot it. Student, I want you to think about bringing these up to your disability service provider in the future. All of these are accommodations I have either approved in the past for a person with mental health conditions, but also GI distress related. So that is going to be our IBD folk, as well as maybe that transition to college has been really difficult and you decided as a person with celiac to try out the dining halls for a while, but now you're starting to have negative implications as a result of that. Maybe some accommodations like this could help you while doing that transition period or transition period to not being on the meal plan and cooking for yourself. Um, so all of these are really good. They impact you on fatigue levels. They impact your need to use the restroom frequently, urgently, however that may look for you. Um, it also can be really important when thinking about um, you during a flare. So the food and water and medication can be very impactful. If you just had a surgery um, and you need to take an exam or you need to sit in class, but you still need to take some medication halfway through, it might be really good to have that on hand. And um, while masking policies have relaxed, some classes um, might still require a mask and this can assist you in being able to drop it down and take your medication. Um, everything else, yeah. If you have questions about any of these, we can kind of go over them a little later as well. Um, and then moving on to probably something that you haven't thought about, at least I did not think about in higher education is kind of going into a housing situation that is very much not your normal. So it's very common in the US that you share your bedroom with the person and they're like five feet away from you. Um, it's also really common to share a bathroom at the end of the dorm, at the end of the hall. I remember freshman year, I shared my room with another person and I shared five toilets and five sinks among 40 girls on one floor. If you're kind of needing the bathroom urgently and it's rush hour traffic time of everybody waking up and using the bathroom, it can be a moment of, am I gonna poop my pants? Um, and I don't want that to happen to, you, happen to you. So maybe considering what type of accommodations do you need? Do you need a place to go back to that is solely yours? 
So then you can decompress, um, whether that's just from the fatigue levels or just the mental health aspect, um, lowering bed. So then you don't have to eat yourself into your bed because that's pretty tall. So lowering that down to help you. Same thing, first floor or a residence with an elevator. Stanford, we only have a couple of places with an elevator and some of our buildings are pretty tall. And going up one flight of stairs can be really hard if you're really fatigued at that time. Um, and then our favorite bathrooms. What type of bathroom situation do you wanna do? Um, are you okay? Are you in remission? Are you doing pretty fine? Okay, maybe just do near communal bathroom. Are you actively in a flare? Um, have a J pouch, have an ostomy? Um, maybe you need to share your bathroom with like a smaller number of people or have a private bathroom altogether. Um, something important to think, if you are kind of having accidents as a result of surgery, ostomy, J pouch. Um, it might be beneficial to do private bathroom. Only one sanitary reason, but also eliminate that distress and uncomfortableness of walking down the hall um, while you feel kind of gross. Um, so please don't put yourself into that. Um, and then another fun thing, um, you can be located closer to where you're gonna be. So that way, if you have classes in main in engineering quad. Well, that way your residence is super close to engineering quad and you don't have to walk really far across campus after a class. You can go back, take a nap, go back to class. Just don't sleep through your alarm. I did that a lot. Um, and then also you can be closer to the student health center or the hospital, depending on what type of university you're going to. If you're going to a major institution um, like UC Berkeley, UCLA, any of the UCs, I think they all have hospitals. I'm from Missouri, so I, I don't know UC system very well, so I'm sorry. Um, but most large universities will have a hospital connected. If you go to a smaller school, you might not have that close proximity, but there's still going to be something like a campus health center. Um. And then I'm going to briefly touch on dining. I briefly touch on dining because dining is a very individualized thing. I feel like dining is so individualized that I really want Farah to speak on it more, um, only because it comes with a lot of things that are outside of my wheelhouse. Um, while I do avoid gluten, um, I'm not the expert in all diets and anything. So some things that you can think about, um, kitchen access, celiac people, you might wanna limit the number of people within your common um, or within your private kitchen. So if you have really best friends that like also avoid gluten, are very good about not doing cross-contamination, maybe only doing a kitchen with three people, for example, would be beneficial. If you're really new to this and you are a little more hesitant, maybe go full private. Um, or if you just need a supplement, like any of our IBDers who need like an additional snack throughout the day, maybe access to the communal kitchen is what you need. And then meal plans, please work with your disability service center. This is very individualized for each university. Every university I have attended myself and worked at has had a different way of viewing this. So make sure that you look into this. Um, and then the last thing is being as close as possible to the dining hall. If it's hard, if it's really fatiguing to just get up out of bed to class, it's also gonna be hard to go get nutrition and feed yourself and feel more comfortable and confident with your body. Oh. I totally forgot I did this one. This one is a late add-on that I did, so please excuse me. Um, so a new pet project of mine, I shouldn't call it a pet project because it sounds really bad, but a new subspecialty of mine um, at Stanford has been understanding how students with disabilities are studying abroad. 
So something that you really want to think about, if you think you're going to study abroad, which you absolutely should, it looks amazing. I watch my students do all the time and it looks wonderful. Um, start working with your GI, your PCP, your therapist, your registered dietitian um, at least six months in advance. The reason why is if you were on Remicade, how are you going to get an infusion if you are somewhere for like a lot of months? So maybe there's a possible medication change that you need to do or starting to navigate where are you going to get that infusion if you're, say, in London or Santiago, Chile. So you kind of need to start thinking about this months and months in advance. And if that means working with mom, dad, primary caregiver, please do because well, it's really hard to learn insurance while also learning higher ed, you're probably still going to need them, especially for the international aspect. I don't even know the international aspect of my insurance um, and should probably look into that at some time. Another aspect that you might want to look into is getting what is called a vacation policy on your medication. Um, call up insurance again, say, hey, I need six months or an extra three months of my Zoloft because I'm going to be studying abroad. Um, because you kind of need that. You can't get that over there as easily. And then on top of that, um, bringing extra ostomy supplies, bringing extra underwear, do it, extra pants, um, any type of liquid hydration system and a water bottle. Please don't get dehydrated. I think Europeans are dehydrated. I'm engaged to one. He's constantly dehydrated. Don't be a dehydrated European, um, especially with your IBD. It's going to be really bad. And then on top of that, um, outside of like studying abroad, kind of little things to think about. And I'm more than happy to like chat about this as well afterwards is where are your specialty medication going to go? Uh, you kind of don't want to send it to the massive inbox system of the university, especially if you're going to a massive university of over like 20,000 students. Um, at Stanford, you can ship your specialty medication. So for example, I could ship my Renvoc to um, Vaden Health Center, which is our student health center, and they will keep it. Let's say you have Stellara, which is refrigerated, um, or Humira, you can also send it to them. They will put it in the fridge for you. So if it takes you until the next day due to scheduling conflict, super cool. It's still refrigerated and you're all set. Another important thing to find is your nearest pharmacy. So you're going to pick up your medication. And then on top of that, um, where are you going to go in case of an emergency? And this is really important. And then also knowing what type of communication is needed. So finding that best friend who's going to say, texting your mom or dad, hey, Jimmy Sue is in the hospital. What do we do? Um, kind of walking your friends through that is also really important, but also knowing yourself what you need to do. I always had like a little backup bag with me that had like my Rinvoc in it because my hospital never carried it. So it was really good to have that. Um, on top of that, PJs, shoes, um, comfy slippers is always a good one, and a pillow and a blanket. It gets too cold in the hospital. Um, so yeah, those are some like little rundown of IBD, celiac. I'm really sorry, celiac people. We will do better next time for you. But Farah, Farah is here this year, so she's got this. Thank you, Riley. Thank you so much. I think you covered a ton and, and yeah, all right, take it away. All right. Well, first of all, I want to say that I'm super excited for this next chapter in your lives. Um, I've already had patients reach out to me expressing how excited they are, but I also got some questions about navigating eating in college, especially when following a specific diet for medical reasons like the gluten-free diet for celiac disease or like the Crohn's disease exclusion diet or other nutritional therapies for IBD. So I'm really glad that we're having this event at this time. 
Um, and I collected some tips and resources to hopefully help a little bit with that college prep, especially as it relates to eating. So getting right into it. My first tip is to not hesitate to and to get comfortable with letting others know about your dietary restrictions. And even though this can be uncomfortable for some, communicating about your dietary needs and asking questions can bring you some clarity and make you feel supported and can make things feel easier in the long run. So to ask for accommodations, and I know Riley talked about this a little bit, um, to ask for accommodations at the dining hall or cafeteria, you can check in with dining and residential services and or even um, disability resource centers. Some colleges, um, you'll notice that different colleges allow different meal plans, but some of them allow for like a flexible meal plan where you can eat at different spots near campus. Um, some colleges allow for specific modifications or even meal exemptions, meaning like not having a meal plan at all and kind of doing your own thing, um, you know, on your own. Some colleges also have a dietitian on campus, and I've had patients tell me that they found the interactions and guidance from the dietitian on campus helpful because um, I won't know all the different options that there are at that specific college, so they're a great resource when it comes to eating specifically on campus and at different dining halls. Um, also, talking to roommates or housemates about your dietary restrictions can make living with them feel easier and safer, especially if you have to worry about cross contact or something like that, then it can make just things go smoother. And then talking to friends about your dietary restrictions can make eating out easier. That way you can collaborate on eating out and picking a spot where you each can find your favorite foods and feel comfortable. And um, speaking of eating out, also restaurant staff can only accommodate you if they know what your dietary needs are. So that's another spot where communicating about your needs can be helpful to you. Okay, my second tip is to, um, if you have multiple dietary restrictions and you enjoy cooking or you want to develop your cooking skills, you can consider asking for or looking for a room with a kitchen or a kitchenette. This can be in your specific unit or sometimes there are communal kitchens like in the same building or nearby. Um, this can be time consuming. I know we're all busy college students, but it can allow for some flexibility, autonomy, and ease of mind for some people. So just know that that's an option. And then no matter what your meal plan is or how big or small your dorm room is, you'll always hear me saying to please stock up your room with some foods that you enjoy. Um, even if you have a meal plan, a lot of my patients find it helpful to have snacks or even um, breakfast options since the mornings tend to be tough for some people and um, to kind of have some foods available to grab and go. Um, and when working on accommodations, check if you can have a larger fridge or a freezer or a microwave. Um, some colleges even allow some small and helpful appliances like a toaster or a kettle or blender to make smoothies. So kind of check in when you're looking into accommodations. You can keep like shelf-stable food in your room, like a trail mix or a protein bar. You, If you have a fridge, you can keep things like yogurt and fruit. If you have a freezer, you can keep like leftover foods or food from family. Um, and then keep in mind that sometimes you don't need any fancy appliances to make quick meals, like sometimes you can just use the microwave to cook something. So keep those in mind and based on your preferences and your dietary needs. And then my fourth tip um, kind of relates to the one before is uh, to always carry snacks around. So all the foods that I just mentioned to you, grab them to go and take them with you to your snack, uh, to your um classes so that you can eat them when you're in a rush. Thank you, Garrett. Now, next slide. <laughs> um, now, once you choose your college, I find it helpful to get familiar with the area and um, especially when you have free time, like in the summer or before your class loads, you know, goes higher. So you can look for local grocery stores to see um, where you can do your shopping at. You can search for restaurants nearby. If you are on a gluten-free diet, you can use Find Me Gluten-Free. 
um, which is a website or an app where you can search for restaurants nearby. Otherwise, you can look on Yelp or Google. And then if you want to take it a step further while you have some free time, you can make a list of restaurants that sound good to you and that sound like they would be accommodating. And this list can be helpful to use later on when you're busy and when you want to just find somewhere quick and go and eat out there. Um, and then finally, do remember that you can always follow up with your care team if you need anything, especially now if, when we have telehealth visits. As long as in, you're in California, you can meet with us. And if you're out of state, you I would really recommend finding a care team in your college town that includes a dietitian. And then remembering that you can also find a dietitian on campus, um, depending on your college, too. Next slide, please. Okay, here I just have a couple of resources that talk a little bit more about eating in college for celiac disease and for IBD. Um, so maybe we can keep this up for just a minute. And if you want to check those out, you can look on your camera and just scan those. Um, if you have any problems with that, please let me know and I can drop the link in the chat as well. And we will be... Um including these in one of the last slides too. So if you don't catch it right now, totally fine. Is this, uh, what is this um, uh, leading parents to, Farah? This is just more tips and tricks about eating um, in college, specifically for celiac disease on the left and then for IBD on the right. Some of the things I talked about with a little bit more. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Hopefully you guys got that QR code. And again, that'll be available at the end of the presentation too. Figure it all you. Yeah. And I did want to um, include uh, one more um, resource that we have. Um, we work with uh, Beyond Celiac, uh, another great resource that we have online for our celiac disease patients. Um, they actually have a free handbook online. That's 10 pages um, that just talks about things to think about. Uh, while preparing for college. Um, the link is right here. Don't need to write it down. Um, we'll send it to you in the in the chat box a little later, and it will also um, be at the end of the presentation as well. Uh, it kind of goes over a lot of stuff we've been talking about, but just more focused on CBX. So um, now I want to um, kind of re-engage our uh, psychologist, Dr. Ren. And um, her and I will be going over mental health and um, adherence to medical care uh, in your college experience. Um, so we want to um, just make sure that we are not forgetting about our mental health, kind of like what Riley was talking about in the beginning. Um, we want to make sure that our physical and our mental health, uh, our emotional health are as, as important as our grades. I think these things kind of get lost in the pressure and the new environments, new social relationships, new freedom. A lot of this stuff is is like kind of maybe lower down on the list of priorities. Um, and that can, can actually really be detrimental to your experience in the long run. Um, a big way to keep that priority of your mental health and your emotional and sorry and physical health up is to maintain communications with your medical team through my chart and regular follow-up appointments. We want to make sure that um, your my chart account is set up for your young adult patient um, before you leave um, and uh, want to make sure that um, that you're comfortable with the app that you're comfortable with like sending messages, reading messages and um, something to make sure that you you go over before uh, leaving for college. Um, with that said, um, things to be communicating to your medical team are symptoms, um, things that you might uh, have questions about on campus, things that you think are concerning. And no, no questions are dumb questions. We have a very uh, compassionate and patient uh, medical team that are happy to help uh, answer any questions that you have, even from, uh, from college. And if we catch those um, those issues early, we might um, avoid a bigger issue down the road. Um, unmanaged mental health needs can lead to increased disease activity. Um, and I 
I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Ren to talk a little bit about this. This is something that we talk about a lot. Sure. Yeah, happy to. Thanks, Garrett. Yeah, you know, in, in addition to just being in touch with the medical team um, about symptoms, whether things you're concerned about, maybe a parent is concerned about from what you've shared, also really being in touch with your team and prioritizing just stress and mental health is so important. So that may be to your doctor, that may be to me if I'm on your team or to Garrett, or if you have an outside therapist or psychiatrist, like Riley mentioned before, but really, really being just as aware of stress rising and mental health um, things popping up, like feeling a little bit more anxious the first time in college or feeling a little bit more down and isolating yourself. These are things that are so important because, well, they are your mental health, right? And that is part of who you are and impacts your quality of life, um, but also because it can impact your disease. So it can impact IBD, it can impact celiac. And so when we think of the brain gut connection, really the take home is that what's going on up here, right? Our emotions. So, you know, taking stress as an example, because stress is something that's pretty universal to every single person in the world who does anything, but particularly who goes to higher education and to college. And if we have really unmanaged stress and other sort of bigger emotions, where they're so directly, our brain and our GI tract are so directly connected. It's called our second brain, our GI tract. And we like feel emotions in our body. So I'm not sure if anyone here has ever heard, I have a gut feeling or I have butterflies in my stomach. Some of these phrases really speak to this experience of emotions that we can have in our GI tract. So messages are kind of about stress and emotions kind of can think about it very quickly go to our GI tract and can increase symptoms. So for some people, it might not be a flare or disease activity, but it might be more bloating or it might be pain. Um, it might be nausea, right? It might be urgency, like have to hightail to the bathroom before a big final. Um, and then when we're feeling icky physically, well, what happens to our emotions? We feel worse, right? We feel more stress. We might feel more down or more anxious. And we can really get into a vicious cycle between unmanaged stress and emotional health challenges and IBD and, and sometimes celiac symptoms too. Um, so it goes both ways and is really, really important to be aware of this. And there is, to the point that's on the PowerPoint, some research to show that stress and unmanaged emotional distress can be a contributing factor to an IBD flare. Um, not for everyone, but that can that can occur. So just really take home as prioritizing your mental health and your stress. And for some, well, for everyone, healthy lifestyle choices have a huge impact on our mental health and stress. So I know this may sound simple, but it's hard to do, especially in college, to like get good sleep. So sort of that eight to 10 hours, I know you guys all might be laughing when I say that, you all might be laughing, but really thinking of eight hours of sleep and more regular sleep schedules. Um, um, eating regular meals, right? Three meals a day plus snacks or for people um, that have different dietary needs and plans that they've made with far or others, that's fine. But just eating um, or drinking, you know, ensure or anything else that's in your, um, in your diet really regularly. And then moving your body. It's so easy to hole up in a library and not get as much exercise as we need in college. But whether that's walking, playing a sport, going to the gym, just something to help you blow off steam and stress is really important and helpful for our physical health. Um, and then not just study, right? Enjoy social th activities and um, fun things outside of school and then time to relax. All of these lifestyle choices have a huge impact on our stress and lowering our stress and, you know, boosting our mood and bringing down anxiety. So those are really helpful Um things to remember going to school and prioritize. Um, and then sometimes we need more support. And that is really important to be aware of too. Like the lifestyle stuff just isn't kicking it. We're still feeling, can't, can't manage stress. Our anxiety is through the roof. Are we feeling more depressed? And then there's other resources. Um, and maybe Garrett, I'll, I realize I will pass it back to you to, to talk about the last couple. Sure. And and those resources, um, you can always reach out to us like we talked about through my chart. But on campus, like was referenced before, there's always going to be a counseling center. Um, it's easy. You can usually sign up for sessions online and um, usually have three to five sessions that are free, that are, you know, a part of your uh, package as a student. And then if needs still exist after those three to five sessions, they'll actually help you find uh, a therapist off campus. Um, uh, ideally, we can always be a resource. I've helped people look for therapists 
in other states before um, because we're not allowed to um, take um, uh, provide care for for patients that are outside of the state lines, but um, we can help you find a therapist in the area. So please let us know if that's something that you need. Um, but definitely familiarize yourself with the counseling center. Um, um, and yeah, like I said, reach out to us if you have any questions really related to mental health uh, and managing your IBD and CX disease. Um, can, can I say make one more plug? Sorry. Um, with that, if what you're experiencing at school is more stress or emotional distress really related to managing IBD or celiac at school, right? Or feeling like you need some more stress management tips and tricks or symptom management, you know, Garrett and I are also here to provide support to you too. So sometimes it makes way more sense to see someone in person on campus, but sometimes you really need the person who has more expertise in mental health and celiac or mental health and IBD. And we are absolutely here for that and provide, um, um, support to our patients here, Definitely. even when they're college. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and especially like if that that transition kind of happens a little bit more naturally when we uh, have our 18-year-old patients, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, you don't need to always involve your parents. We can then deliver support to you. Um, but uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Some things I wanted to mention uh, with our young adults going to college um, some pitfalls, some interruptions in care we think can be avoided include unanswered MyChart messages or phone calls to the patient. When our patients turn 18, often um, they get rights, um, a lot of rights to, to just be the sole contact for uh, medical care. And so if a couple, a couple bullets down, if a release of information is not signed by the 18-year-old patient to provide their parents with access to their medical chart, sometimes there can be interruptions in care. Uh, for instance, if we're trying to set up follow-up appointments and we can't get in touch with the patient, that's an issue. If we are asking for labs being done and we can't get in touch with the patient, that's an issue. There can be barriers if, if that release of information is not signed or if people aren't paying attention to the my chart messages. Um, and, and in really tough scenarios. Sometimes there's a really significant delay, months and months between follow-up appointments. Our team is trying to get in touch with you. I'm calling you, I'm texting you. It's not, we're not getting anything. Um, sometimes our doctors are unable to approve medications if it's been long enough between appointments. Um, if it's been over six months between appointments, op uh, often we're not allowed to re-prescribe your medications. And that is really important when you're dependent on some of these um, inflammatory bowel disease uh, medications. So please, please make sure you get in the practice of um, checking out your mind chart on a regular basis. Um, and as you are getting ready for college right now, if you're a senior next year, if you're a junior at any time, just continue to increase your independence with your care and your comfort in communicating with us medical team. And never, never hesitate to ask us for, for more help uh, with getting to that point. Um, before we get to the question and answers, I just want you all to mark your calendars for additional webinars coming up in the future. Um, we have a couple in, in May and June coming up. Um, in May, um, uh, cooking and baking a gluten-free lunch. Um, some uh, recipe demonstrations as well as um, how to how to choose uh, summer camps coming up. So um, that is the website. Uh, I can send it to you in the chat box in the future. Um, but I just want to put this in the back of your heads um, if, if any of these events uh, are interesting to you. 